Thank you, Alex. Well, this is perfect segue when she said background in nursing because this is years and years ago we talked about having a residency program that we could model, use the medical uh, model as an example, uh, whereas, you know, they finish four years of a program uh, in med school and then they have to go into their fellowships and their residencies and it was nothing quite like that for any other discipline outside of nursing. So that's how the, um, thanks Alex, because that's actually how the program was hatched and that's part of how this program was modeled. Um, actually, I want to just briefly today go over how we plan for the program, uh, the implementation phases, the challenges we faced, successes that we realized, and what we have relearn, learned as a result. Um, the NDSR program was formed uh, in a collaboration with the University of Maryland, uh, excuse me, <laughs> University of Maryland, uh, I, the IMLS, and the Library of Congress. And it is actually, uh, I think, the hope uh, of IMLS that the NDSR program will serve the professional community uh, and American people by developing the next generation of digital stewards. And it's important that we do this to ensure safekeeping of our nation's rich cultural assets, and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, the NDSR um, actually was designed to uh, enable 10 recent postgraduates uh, from the disciplines of library and information science uh, to come into the program and complete hands-on training. At the opening of the program, the residents went through a two-week immersion workshop, and I'm sure Andrea will talk to you how they've modeled that in Boston, uh, but it was a two-week immersion workshop that was based on a lot of the principles that Nancy McGovern from MIT uh, had initiated for some of her digital preservation management training pro, uh, classes. Uh, through the nine months, they went to conferences. The residents went to conferences, attended educational symposia, uh, et cetera, all while working on their specific projects. That slide, that went too fast. Um, basically, the program that we started attempts to achieve its mission by defining core competencies of digital stewardship training, creating a community of experts in the field, and establishing a national model, and this is key, for digital stewardship training, and most importantly, bridging classroom education with professional experience. Uh, we created this program in a vast, uh, because we realized that there was a vast training gap uh, back around fiscal years uh, 2010 and 2011. And Nancy McGovern and I did this survey and we found that 84% of the institutions queried responded that they had digital content that must remain accessible for 10 years or more. However, only 33% of the organizations actually had qualified staff dedicated to the preservation of those digital objects. Now through this, of course, we saw a need for NDSR. And we really wanted to form a program that was going to help implement content acquisition and preservation strategies, especially in the born digital because it's disappearing as we sit here today. Also, we wanted them to understand how to store, protect, manage, and ensure long-term access of an institution's content. Now, why a residency program? There's a multitude of reasons why. One, Washington has many large institutions that serve as repositories of information and just in extremely large amounts of both digitized and born digital material. There is tremendous value in this information. As you know, we collect the Twitter archive. The research potential is tremendous. But in many instances, these institutions face challenges with collecting, preserving, and making the high volume of content accessible due to limited human 
and fiscal resources. And also, there's another major challenge which results from achieving the critical buy-in uh, from senior leadership. A lot of senior leadership doesn't understand what is digital preservation. I mean, I don't know how many times people have asked you, what are you doing? You say, oh, I work in digital preservation, and they look at you like you just said, said something from Hogwarts. I mean, really. The commitment to secure and deploy appropriate technology systems and hire well-trained staff is absolutely necessary to ensure long-term management of an organization's digital assets. Now, it has become very obvious to us that some public and private organizations even struggle with developing a thoughtful digital preservation strategy, or even one at all. I could tell you three or four if I wanted to divulge that segment. They don't have a true digital preservation strategy. They're going at it in pieces or chunks. Now, shifting to the education and training landscape, I think that many of us can agree that there is a true gap that exists when students leave a classroom and go to work. They just don't have the hands-on experience in their area of specialty. They may have worked in a department store or whatever, but they've actually not been embedded in a team that's doing this type of work. During the resident selection process, it was obvious to us that some students graduate, as I just said, with no experience whatsoever. In addition, there is no true standard model for experiential training in the U.S. that I know of. And Andrea and Kari can speak to that if they know of any. It's everybody does something a little different. It appears that there's a variety of programs with varying curriculums and educational priorities that have emerged with people scrambling trying to set this up. I think it is personally key that educators start working closely with the field practitioners as they start to design and implement future curriculums. Now, Washington, D.C., as I said, was the pilot site for the inaugural NDSR, and it ran for a year. It just ended May 2015. We faced many challenges. We won some, we lost some. Now the IMLS has funded NDSR programs in Boston and New York, and the DC pilot uh, did, in the early stages, we, we met with uh, the Boston and New York group, inform them to a small degree, or maybe Andrea can speak to that as well, maybe we informed them a little bit more. Uh, but I think the key to this program, and I think this is what NDSR really wants, is it's got to be ongoing collaboration between the project leads of both current and future residency programs. Because we know without collaboration, each experience could easily be a new beginning, susceptible to new or even similar pitfalls. So collaboration here is key. We're spending the government's money. We must work together to have a consistent model that we can offer for the money they've given us. As the program is refined, the hopes are to further expand the program in other parts of the U.S. So far, there are many challenges. I don't have time to go into that, but I will touch on one, and I will give you an idea of that, how others are facing this challenge. We were initially funded for $440,000. The money came straight to the Library of Congress. And the money came to us to use directly for curriculum consultants, mission critical planning meetings, training exercises, and professional development activities. So you can see that a large portion of that just went to the resident stipends. <coughs> Excuse me. The curriculum development panel it was comprised of some of the top digital preservation experts from around the country. And they were charged with identifying critical components of the program's curriculum. And throughout the first few months, the panel was instrumental in steering the content of the curriculum and overall structure of the program's educational experience. You can see Andrea trying to hide behind that woman right there. And uh, this is key. This is key because you're having all different types of, of uh, educators, 
uh, and other uh, community uh, professionals uh, to come together to help form this residency. The curriculum was de developed by this panel, uh, was brought to light by the instructors of the NDSR Immersion Workshop. Uh, again, Nancy McGovern of MIT Libraries was instrumental in guiding us through the Immersion Workshop experience. Excuse me. And I want to mention that Nancy is also one of the uh, project leads of the NDSR Boston. The two-week Immersion Workshop, I think, was key uh, at the beginning of the experience. Um, and it was an overarching experience where they got orientation to their different uh, host sites as well as the immersion program and we wanted to make sure they had a baseline in digital preservation theory. We now realize that more direct instruction on commonly used tools such as Jove, Droid, etc. and a greater focus on practical instruction over theory would be extremely wise and that was in every in, um, residence evaluation. The next step in the program development was identifying potential host institutions. You see those here on the slide. We gathered archivists, librarians, information professionals from around the metro area and we looked uh, at or explained the goals of the program um, and we wanted to get ideas for particular proposals. We wanted to make sure we were including people in the formation of this program. We did not want the Library of Congress to go out and just dictate this is how it's going to be, as is often done sometimes in this community. We wanted projects that are challenging, deeply steeped in some aspect of the digital preservation life cycle, and emphasize that the projects promote innovation and foster leadership development and have a broad impact on the field of digital preservation management as a whole, not just for the institution. We got scores of applications. We selected 10 of those host organizations, and they span government, nonprofit, and university sectors. Now, these are the individuals on the slide that were selected. And the requirements included that they had to have a master's degree, of course, a federal resume, a cover letter, they had to give their interest in qualifications, transcripts, all your typical things of people, I mean, for things that uh, people need when they apply for a job. And I can go into more detail if you have questions when we get to the panel. The two to three minute video that we had them to complete was key for us. They had to do a two to three minute video and submit it Basically, we wanted to see their aptitude for tackling challenges uh, on their, for their preferred host proposals and what their true passion was for digital preservation. And it really showed creative thinking. So that to us was key. Um, now, we had the host involved and they reviewed the packets uh, and uh, went through and picked the top five students turned those back to us, and then we convened a panel at the library, which basically then picked and sorted through the best matches. Now, this slide gives you an example of the projects that the 10 students worked on. And the, it consisted work that, it consisted of work that directly impacted the institution, but as I said, it was very beneficial to the external community. For example, the final deliverable of the Association of Research Libraries project was very important because it provides web accessibility toolkit uh, for research libraries which helps libraries be more inclusive by facilitating access to collections for everyone regardless of ability or disability. Now, over the next series of slides, I will discuss some of the things that we did well, some of the challenges that we faced, the lessons we've learned, and how we'll use the feedback to enhance future NDSR cohorts. Um, 
Positive outcomes for the program, let me go over those first. Prior to the beginning of the residency, we met with hosting institutions to go over the requirements and steps necessary to ensure a smooth onboarding of residents. That's very difficult because each of these institutions had a different way they onboarded. And when you're working with federal institutions, it's very difficult because you have to go through security checks, screens, it's, it's a very involved process. Potential host institutions were also required to provide a detailed project proposal that outlines the residents' deliverables during the nine-month residency program. The hosting institutions, I must say, did a great job at doing this because their projects not only showed uh, or blended into the larger mission of the organization, but it also demonstrated their significance to the digital preservation community as a whole. Obviously, the primary goal of NDSR is to increase the residents' knowledge and skills in the digital stewardship arena and to learn to work effectively as a team. This was a major goal, and we're going to emphasize this more because they did little team things in college. They may work in groups. But it's a big difference when you are thrown into the middle of people that have worked there for five or ten years because some of those people have a tendency to eat their young and they're not always real helpful. So we have to give them the skill sets to know that when they go in, they're going to face these kind of challenges. Now, uh, basically, each potential host, uh, each potential host submitted an application, and the packets required that they contained a letter of commitment signed by the senior executive of the organization. So it was the secretary of the Smithsonian that signed the letter for the Smithsonian Institution. We did not take a director level. It had to be the senior manager, uh, leader of the organization. We had to get a statement of interest. Why is this important, and why is the institution a good fit? They had to identify mentors and that who would be involved in the project and why they thought the mentor was going to be a good mentor. And did the mentor have time? They had to answer all these questions. A project proposal that clearly identified the scope of the work was mandatory. And the resident would complete throughout the experience and it had to have timelines and clear deliverables that we were to check up on. And I'll tell you what happened there. Of all the feedback uh, actually provided by the residents, many felt that the most impact on their future was their ability to network and, and to really become involved with people in the community. 100% of the residents stated in this, the informal survey that we've done that they feel the program made them more competitive in the job market and they attributed this to not only the network they established, but the hands-on training. Our residents have accepted positions at the Smithsonian uh, Public Broadcasting Service. It, they've all done wonderful. Uh, two of them is going on for, for uh, higher degrees, uh, their doctorate. One received their Fulbright scholarship, and another is pursuing her doctorate in The Hague. So it's some successes here. Uh, residents were able to read about the host. Residents were able to read about the host projects before submitting their applications. This was important because it enabled the resident to select the institutions that directly related to their area of interest. They also had the opportunity to meet with the key people from the host institutions because you have to see if there's going to be a fit with the people that you're going to be working with. In order for the resident to feel that their work is valuable, however, it is worthwhile and absolutely necessary, from my perspective, for them to understand how their work will be used in the larger context of the organization. Because the survey showed, sounds like a game show, 73% of the hosts said they will definitely, only 73%, not bad, 73% of the hosts said they will definitely use the work to improve the way the organization conducts its business. And the next cohort, we want to bring that up to at least 90 to 100%. And Andrea is going to have all the answers for us. 
One way to define success is to examine the organization's capacity for digital stewardship before and how it has changed since the onset of the residency program. We didn't look at it before this time. We will come 2015. In this case, 100% of the hosts noted that we had to depend on them to give us this. 100% of the hosts noted that the residence project work moderately increased their organization's capacity for management of their digital assets. And also the formal assessment of the program that is currently undergoing uh, being done uh, by Howard Besser for NYU uh, is showing that some pretty critical program information. Uh, we're going to get together with Howard in July and we'll have more information on that. What you're getting today is mostly the informal assessments that we've done between the residents and host. The funding model was quite challenging for us. I, I, Andrea, I hope she speaks to that because we're a federal agency, so it's totally different for us. Um, long before the residents in, uh, arrived, we found out we could not hire them as a, a part of the Library of Congress. They couldn't be consultants. They couldn't be contractors. It, it was an absolute nightmare. Finally, we did get it worked out. And I can go into specifics later if anybody's interested, but we did get the stipend set up so that they were paid annual, I mean bi-weekly uh, at a GS9, uh, at a GS9 step one level, uh, which equates to about $30,000. Now, because of the um, federal appropriation regulations, as I said, management, program management can't use the money for anything. And because of the environment um, that we currently work in, um, we were not given the physical resources at the library to hire staff or to actually um, travel and represent the program at all. We're going to have to go through this pretty quickly with two minutes left. Okay. All right. But. Um, let me just go into the program management challenges. Um, what we looked at was another challenge was a result of the institution's organizational alignment. This is critical because the resident was hosted by one department. We're not going to fall for this again. And they put it in the proposal that this was going to be the mentor. However, their job or their requirement spanned several departments. And guess what? the several departments that they had to work with had not bought into this idea. So they were not helpful to the resident at all. It caused a lot of problems. We had to go out and do a lot of bridge building. It was things that we did not expect but were ready for at this time. Um, also there was an issue with um, geographical isolation uh, from the mentor. They had the mentor was in one building the resident was in another building. It was a nightmare. The, st the staff didn't know why the resident was there. Uh, I did not know this was going on because you'll find that some residents do not like to speak up. Uh, they're not probably as vocal as some of us in this room. And uh, really, it, it created a problem. So I would suggest that people, the resident needs to be next to the mentor. Um, the other problem, um, is that we, the government closed <laughs> right after we started this program. <laughs> and why was that a big problem? <laughs> some of the students or some of the residents were in non-federal agencies, so they went to work. Others were in federal agencies and the program management staff was in a federal agency. We couldn't go to work and guess what? These students are stuck. In the very expensive city of Washington, D.C., and they were not getting paid. They did get paid, just like we did. Your tax dollars that work there, just make sure you vote for, a, I'm going to put a plug in here. <laughs> <laughs> but really, I mean, it created major problems because it also delayed all of the educational activities that we had planned and, you know, trying to get people scheduled, et cetera. It is a nightmare. Um, 
let me see what I can go through here real quick. Um, I wanted to do the mentors. We required that all mentors attended a basic mentoring training workshop. It was not enough. Uh, I don't care how smart a person is, if they're not a teacher or a mentor, you're going to have problems. And if they're so important that there are other projects and their travel is going to keep them away from their uh, resident, you're going to have problems. So this time, we're going to do what I wanted to do the first time, and I was told, don't do it because it's going to look like the big brother is coming in, the Library of Congress, and you're coming to these other institutions. This time, we're going to interview the mentor, we're going to interview the management staff, we're going to meet with the entire digital preservation team because I want to see what they have in place. Now, I don't have the expertise that Kari and Andrea has, but I have a lot of friends that do. So we're going to go in and we're going to do a quick look at what they've got. Because if they don't have the systems in place to offer this type of training, they're not going to be considered as host because that created real problems. Um, Actually, we need to meet more with the host. And as I said, because of without the staff, uh, actually it was uh, a problem. Let me shoot over here to lessons learned here. After all the experiences and challenges and successes of our first year, the one thing that we have identified is that we learned a lot of what not to do and what we can do better. Uh, we need to allow more time to schedule these classes and these uh, educational programs almost like a year out. Uh, as we start this program, because people like, uh, and I hate to keep picking on Andrea, but people like Andrea and Nancy are very busy. They're, they're renowned people in their field, and they, they travel a lot. Uh, they speak internationally quite a bit. I think you do, right? <laughs> and I know Nancy does. And you have to be able to take all this into consideration if you want to get the top speakers. And we didn't do that. Uh, we firmly believe that the existing cohorts need to learn from each other, and I am going to emphasize this. Because we need to share resources and work together. As I said earlier, Andrea and Nancy, had, they have experiences that we can never begin to match. And we need to depend on them as they move through this cohort to build their curriculum, et cetera, uh, to make our next iteration even stronger. Because we all have to keep in mind, the goal for this is to create a national model not an individual model as we go along, because if we do, we're going to be in the same situation we're in now. And we're not going to have a national model. So we have to work together. Um, basically, uh, let me do next steps. Um, th these are some of the quotes the students left, so you, you can be reading those. But the next steps, we do, uh, we will be doing another cohort. Um, sometime in 2015 we're, we're thinking about how we're going to do this um, it's going to be for 10 students but the difference this time is going to be for a year because it needs to be a year we found that nine months was not a good match um, basically we find that some of the major issues with this is that uh, we need to go closer as i said through the mentors through the host institutions it's going to be a different level of assessment so uh, I can answer any questions. I've already gone over. I apologize for that. Uh, but it was a year, as I said, of, of mistakes, a year of successes. And I wanted to try to share those as closely as possible for anybody that's starting a residency program. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions at this point. Or do you want to defer that no, to the panel? Questions are good. Um, and let me apologize to George for making my watch five minutes faster than the room. That's okay. I hit the button while we're sitting here. So anybody online, if you have questions, I'm going to just shoot um, ahead here. Is that today's meet? Um, Absolutely. Up oh. again. So if you guys want to ask any questions, we have someone in the room with a microphone as well. For those of you in the room, I'm afraid you have to speak into a microphone to ask your question or the people online can't hear. So, questions in the room? 
I noticed that um, the projects seem to both be uh, some research and theoretical projects and some were more practical application to the location's uh, own digital records. Was there any difference in the feedback between the type of project yes. from the host? Yes, you, they're very observant. And that's one of the things I skipped over uh, because of time. That's one of the things we found. We don't want this next, any, uh, the next set of residents, any of them, to be doing research and just documenting best practices. We want them to actually do theoretical work and hands-on work, blend those very closely together and have a real deliverable, like I used as an example for ARL. They actually delivered a product that's used in ARL. PBS also had a project delivered. So yes, we don't want the research. We don't want, they should have done all this. These are all post-masters. And this time, we're going to take post-doctorate as well. So um, it's, it's going to be a little bit different, but it clearly cannot be theory. It's got to be hands-on practical. And that is going to require us to look very closely at the host. I'm going to have a different selecting committee. It will just not be comprised of uh, library staff that work in digital preservation. I'm going to be bring people in that's probably working on the cohorts in Boston, or I'll bring other people in. Um, I don't know who Andrea, she can speak, use to select theirs, um, her and Nancy. Uh, she, uh, but it's, it's got to be a different selection process. We got to dig deeper. Did that answer your question or not? Um, what areas of the country are you recruiting out of? And uh, what uh, skill sets uh, are, your, are you kind of looking for that would make uh, someone in, you know, taking, uh, make this opportunity be, you know, um, make a match uh, for this opportunity? Well, we're recruiting from all over the country. You can come from anywhere in the country. Um, we're actually in conversation now with establishing a, a program like this. I haven't even had a chance to share this with Andrea. Uh, with the uh, University of the West Indies in Jamaica. The Prime Minister has reached out to us and we have reached to them. Um, they want to start a class in digital preservation, uh, uh, distance learning throughout the islands. Um, that's something I want to talk to Nancy about in some detail uh, because of her digital preservation management program and also the U.S. Virgin Islands. So we can't bring, we can bring the U.S. Virgin Islands in, but we can't bring Jamaica in. We cannot bring foreign students in at this time. Skill sets, as I said, there will be masters and postdoctorate this time. Library and information science, they should have a background in that, hopefully. Information technology. Um, what are some others that you look for, Andrea? The, oh, the, oh, yeah, the time range is they've got, you, you cannot be out of school more than two years from the start of the program. So, like, if you graduated a year and a half ago, you can apply. But if it's over two years, you can't. Out of professional school, not out of. Out of professional school. Out of a master's program. Out of a master's program. It's not, not a continuing you had mentioned creating a national program um, and a, a standard. Is that something that you would ever be just giving out to individual institutions, not necessarily to create a residency, but to train their people within the institution? I think that, no, I, I think that universities, um, I didn't mention, and I firmly believe that as they're developing curriculums and their residency programs, because we are working with University of Maryland, and I slipped up and said the University of Maryland early on. It was on my mind. We're working with the University of Maryland. Allison Drewing, uh, the Future of Information Alliance, uh, has hooked us up to, with, with individuals within the school to perhaps look at their curriculum. And instead of just doing 240 hours of a, whatever you would call it, externship, uh, placement, whatever, I mean, Kari is going to speak about that, I think, different types of those, is that um, we're not, they want to do something maybe at least to give them six months where they're actually uh, embedded in a team and a project that's worked on with their advisor. 
So I can't say this would be a national model for schools because we can't dictate that. I don't know how this is going to work. I have suggested to IMLS, um, and I think we're going to look at that when we uh, get together uh, at the digital preservation meeting in July in Washington, D.C. that's sponsored by NDSA, um, that we, we need to talk about how can we make this a model where if it needs to be replicated throughout the country, how is it going to be done in such a way that, the, that students in Boston and New York and D.C. get the same type of curriculum, uh, the same type of experience, the same branding, the same communication, et cetera. Everything is set up because it needs to be consistent. And I have, we have, there's all kinds of ideas. I know uh, Nancy and I had spoke about, oh, sorry. Nancy, I wonder. Uh, Nancy and I spoke about creating hubs, training hubs, six regional training hubs with another program that we've worked on and we're starting to revive which is the Digital Preservation Outreach and Education Program. If you had these training hubs, then you'd have consortiums where you could do these different programs and you could actually do a very meaningful exercise. I think the NDSR is a very sustainable program. That's the other challenge that I face. I can't go out, people, um, I will not name the company, I told Andrea the other night, I've been offered that they want to sponsor a chair and they will not let me do it because it seems to be in competition, or it's viewed as competition with another program that has chairs. So, um, I, but I think this program is easily sustainable to some degree, with especially heavy, heavily endowed universities like the MITs, the Stanfords, Harvard, and things like that, and technology people, because um, MasterCard International has the most amazing residency program and they, what they do is they pick the top 1% from their business and accounting schools in the Midwest. And they bring X number of students in. They give them a preloaded MasterCard. They give them housing. That's how they do succession planning. Because they get to interview these students for six months and they see how they work. So it's really much cheaper than them going out doing a headhunting type of thing. But I'm not sure that our community is there yet, or if the skill, or if, it's in, if things are in place yet to do that. Because I think we're still. I've been involved in this for 12 years, and I know I talk with others in the community. I think we're still not quite compass savvy. We're not all headed in the right direction. I think it will happen. I think critical mass will be reached at some point in both training um, and uh, curriculum development, um, but we're not there yet. Several questions from the field. Uh, several questions from the field, uh, starting with uh, how does this relate to smaller organizations? I think there's uh, some questions in the field about how this can be scaled down. Well, actually, many of the res I shouldn't say many, we only had 10. That's exaggerating. <laughs> um, a couple of the residents work at small institutions. Uh, Dumbarton Oaks is, is very small. Uh, this year, we have a great interest from the Hillwood. Now, that's placing residents to help them with the development of some new uh, tools or whatever that they may have. I think that how could they, how could a smaller institution sponsor it? I definitely believe in partnerships. Working with a larger institution, whether it be another university that's piloted this, like Harvard, the Library of Congress, and there's always grants out there, but I think partnering, if you're small, is key. Because being small, you're not going to have the resources that's something that a large university or, and Carrie's going to talk about that, I think, right? Good. Another question from the field. Uh, are there plans to create one to two week programs for those of us who graduated more than five years ago, but still feel we need training? No, but you can tell them to write us and then we'll talk about doing that. No, I'm just kidding. Bingo back. Um, uh, really, I, no. Um, not at this time. But she could, I mean, if they have ideas, write us. I will always share this with Andrea. I'm sure she's going to leave her 
information up as well in Arcaria. I mean, we're always looking at, at, at exploring new opportunities. I don't want to shut any new ideas down. I think that's a horrible thing to do.